QuickBooks Desktop 2023 Sales Receipt Form. Let's do it with Intuit's QuickBooks Desktop 2023. QuickBooks Desktop Sample Rock Castle Construction Practice File provided by QuickBooks. Going through the setup process we do every time, maximizing the home page to the gray area. Going to the View dropdown, open Windows List on the left hand side. Reports drop down to get to those major financial statements, company and financial, that being the P&L, profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement. From 010124 to 123124, that being the date range. Let's customize that report so I can go to the fonts and numbers and change the font to 12. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then we're going to go to the reports again, find the other major financial statement report under the company and financial, that being the balance sheet standard. Changing the date 123124, customizing it to. So we can change the fonts and numbers to 12 again. Is that okay? Yes, it is okay. Okay. And that's our startup process every time. Back to the home page. We've been looking at the customer cycle, which we can see as the revenue cycle, we might call it, or the sales cycle or the accounts receivable cycle. Remembering that customers for QuickBooks means that at the end of the day, we're hoping to get money increases deposits to our checking account typically at the end of the cycle for goods and services we provide to the customer we might do that in a fairly easy kind of process depending on the industry such as if we're in the gig work where we might wait till it clears the bank use bank feeds to record the deposit or we might have a more complex system possibly still a cash based system but one in which we make transactions or sales at the same point in time we receive the revenue like a food truck and we want to record the sales receipt and then the deposit or we might be in a system as we've been talking about in terms of the forms where we have to build the client like a law firm a bookkeeping firm possibly a, a, a landscaping company or something we do the work we build the client when we build the client notice like notice the terminology here oftentimes you hear we build the client but from invoices perspective we're invoicing the client it's the same it's basically the same thing but just remember in practice we can use these two terms kind of interchangeably from quickbooks perspective we have to name the form based on which side of the table we are on so when we are entering it into quickbooks we're invoicing the clients that would increase the accounts receivable the other side go into sales we could then receive the payment which typically decreases the accounts receivable always does that the other side often goes into undeposited funds although could be deposited directly into the checking account and then we make the deposit which would take it out of undeposited funds and put it into the checking account so now we're thinking about a situation where we have the create sales receipt the create sales receipt is the form that we should be using if we're doing a full service bookkeeping for a cash based system so note again you could do something easier than a full service cash based system one in which you're reliant on the bank in order to record the transactions and then you're recording the transactions based on the bank's information possibly using bank feeds so that would be here doing just skipping the the create sales receipt just recording the deposit that would be applicable if you're in a company such as gig work where you're getting paid by like a platform like youtube or something's just paying you and you just whenever the deposit hits the bank you just want to record that deposit as income you typically have the information to help you track by customer because that will be in the memo of the deposit and that's a nice straightforward kind of situation however uh it'll be a little bit more complex for example if you have something like a food truck or something you can imagine the create sales receipt as the form you might use if you're making a sale at a point like at a register for example in that case you don't typically want to make sales because you can imagine making multiple sales collecting multiple forms of payments including cash possibly and then go into the bank at the end of the day you're going to deposit all that into the bank in some way shape or form however you got paid and then you could wait till it clears the bank and just record that lump sum of cash deposit as revenue you could do that but you're skipping some internal controls by doing that because one you can't record who you receive the money from you can't track who you receive the money as well because that's typically done in the sales receipt if you make a deposit with just cash 
or if it, even if it goes through a credit card account, it might be more difficult to get the customer information into your system if you just record it as a, a lump uh, deposit at the end of the day. And you can't do the typical internal controls you would like to do if you're in a cash register situation. That would be, you wanna have your sales receipts that you're gonna be recording for the sales that are taking place. You wanna count the cash typically that you've gotten and compare that to basically the sales receipts that you've been recording within the system. So you can make sure that those two tie out so that there hasn't been theft or anything that happened or you met, something got messed up uh, you, you know, in that process. And then you'll typically want to uh, make the deposit uh, from there and group the deposits in such a way that they will be seen on the bank statement, making the bank reconciliation as easy as possible. So let's imagine a situation. Let's say we, we were going to go into the create sales receipt. Again, we kind of can imagine that we're at like a check register and we can open up the sales receipt. We're going to make a sale and it looks similar to an invoice. It will be much the same as an invoice, except that we're not going to be hitting accounts receivable. So I'm going to go back to a prior one here. Let's go back to a prior one. I'm going to close up the carrot on the left and on uh, the right. And so there we have the basic information. We're going to have a customer. Now note that, that it could be quite nice to be adding the customers as you go, because the customers could be quite important depending on the business you're in, in order to track them, because you might want to send them things like, you know, a sale, your, your sales or what you're going to be selling in the future, have them on your mailing list and so on. Although you might be in a type of company where you don't need to track as much information because you don't expect to see that individual again or something, it might not be as important, but it's nice as you add the sales receipt to be able to add the customer information. You've got the class, which is going to be specific to a particular industry like construction. We might talk about that later. That might not be there unless you've got class. It won't be there unless you turned on class tracking. Notice that we could deposit it into the checking account here. And I believe this option would be something that would be put in place when we changed the options in the preferences field. So if it's not there, if that option isn't there, you'll recall from the prior presentation when we had the payments, we went into the preferences, we went into payments, company preferences, and we unchecked this, which I believe is checked by default, use undeposited funds as a default deposit to account. So, so in other words, it may automatically most of the time be going to undeposited funds rather than going into the checking account. Let's go to a prior one. Most of these are going direct, they got them going directly into the checking account. So in any case, this one might be going to in some cases, the undeposited funds account, which could be quite common because again, you might be getting paid with say cash. If you're getting paid with checks, then you would think that, that it would be something that's going to hit the bank in the same uh, amount as the check amount. But if you're making a lot of cash sales, what will end up happening is you're gonna have to group those cash sales together and you're probably going to deposit them in one lump sum at the end of the night. Therefore, you don't want to make each sales transaction going directly into your checking account because then when you try to reconcile to the to the bank statement, uh, it won't you'll have to add up all those all those amounts to tie out to what has been deposited on the bank statement with one lump sum amount. So that's what we want to keep aware of. You could get you could get paid with cash, you might have a check, and then we could have a, a credit or debit. Note that the credit or debit card is another kind of confusing component with regards to this matching situation because the credit card company is might be grouping the amounts of payments that they're getting, possibly recording a charge as well, and then depositing that amount into your checking account. You want to make sure that you have a system set up so that you're making a deposit that matches the same grouping format as the credit card company, which may require you to go in and out of an undeposited funds account. You could get an e-check as well. So, so basically recording the transaction that you got through an e-check. So if we go then, we've got the date here. We've got the sales number typically generated automatically, sold to. Typically all we need is the name, but you might want more information than that if you can collect it when you're making sales to customers so that you can give the customer you know, your sales st stuff in the future, right? And then you've got your item. Just like with the invoice, the items are going to be very important to make the sales process as easy as possible because the item 
is going to tell us what the rate is that we sell whatever we're selling for making it easy for someone if they're just entering as they make if they're entering the sales into the system as they make the sales then you want to make the item category as easy as possible that will pull up so if you imagine being in a store and you go to the cash register the person putting the data into the cash register should not need to be a genius you know and know everything about the double entry accounting system in order to just record the transaction the way to make that as easy as possible is to make these items uh, appropriate correct easy to fill out when you're entering the deposit form as well as setting up things like the sales tax we'll talk about how to set up those items in a future presentation and then we've got the the description the quantity the rate and then whether it's going to be taxable or not notice down here that we do have a tax applied the tax is a state and local tax in the united states typically the tax is going to be applied to the customer basically in theory so every time we record these transactions we want to think about what's going to be the journal entry before we record them then we'll go to the source doc where they completed forms balance sheet income statement the financial statements and drill back down and kind of double check them remember that you do have like like the cheat sheet and the reports here which is going to be the tr the uh, the transaction journal hopefully it opens this time so that gives you basically your journal entry so that it'll show you the accounts that are impacted so we got the checking account we've got the the materials and then we've got the sales tax now notice this one's a little bit more tricky with the inventory just like with the just like we saw with the invoice because with inventory you could have a system where you just mark up the inventory and then sell it or you might have a system where you're going to be taking raw material and conforming it to an end product in which case you're going to use a job cost system or process cost system which is a little bit different a little bit more confusing a bit more of a specialty so let's close this back out and just kind of an, analyze that we're going to go to the main here and just say what's going to happen well it's a sales receipt that means it's going to increase either undeposited funds or the checking account here they've specified the checking account and then the other side and what's going to go into there the full amount that we're going to collect from them at the same point in time that we that we did the work like if it's a food truck at the point in time we gave them the food right at this point of sale it's a cash-based system still charging sales tax 102 uh, 65 the other side then is going to be going to sales but it's only going to go to sales for what we charged which is the 95 dollars in this case again you might think this tax has kind of messed things up you might think why don't i put the sales at 102.65 then when i pay the sales tax i make an expense of seven dollars and 65 cents or whatever so it'll go on as revenue and then off as an expense we don't do that because it's not really revenue to us in theory or an expense to us in theory instead it's a charge that we're being forced to be the tax collector the, the government has inserted themselves into the system to make us the tax collector. So in theory, we're collecting the 765, which is being charged to the customer, which isn't revenue to us and therefore is gonna go directly to a payable account, uh, accounts payable. So we don't have sales tax expense because the, the revenue never hit the income statement either. It went directly to a payable account is the idea. So that would be that. And so, the, so we got the revenue is at the 95. The difference goes to the payable account and then typically if it's inventory if it was a system where you're just buying inventory and marking it up and not in a job cost system then you would have inventory would be going down by an amount that's not on the the sales receipt because just like when you kind of check something off at a grocery store it only shows you the sales price the sales receipt only shows you like a receipt that you can imagine you give to someone it's not going to show the cost of the inventory that's sold only the sales price but the cost will be there it's known if we set up the items correctly and if we're using a perpetual inventory system then it will decrease the quantity as well as the amount of the cost of the the inventory using a weighted average method i believe is what's going to be used on the desktop version you know fifo lifo weighted average. the other side's going to go to the cost of goods sold account uh, representing the cost of goods sold so there's kind of a lot going on uh, especially if you have inventory even though the sales transaction looks fairly basic fairly easy to look at let's give a quick recap of the items up top we've got the new item to make a new one we can save 
uh, receipt, save as a PDF, you could delete it. We can create a copy of it. If you have a complex receipt, then it could be useful. You can memorize the transactions, make it a little bit easier. Mark as pending. You can print it, you can preview it. So if you're gonna provide these sales receipts to somebody, then you can check out the preview of them. You can email the sales receipt, print later. You can have an attachment to it. You can add time and costs in a similar way as with the invoice. So you could track time, use the time tracking to then add that information into your invoice for example you've got the formatting another preview you can look at the different templates you could set up different templates for the sales receipt although the sales receipt might be something you use more on an internal basis you might not be printing out the sales receipt but of course you might as well as as evidence of the sale too so uh, but obviously the invoice for sure would be going to the external customer Either way, you'd still need them for the internal transaction to record the transaction. Download the, the template, customize data layout. You've got the spelling and you can insert and delete the rows down be below and copy a line as well. You got the send and ship. You've got the email and the FedEx and so on. As we saw with the invoice, you've got the reports. The main one I think is useful is the transaction journal. You could go to some of these reports, but I think a lot of times you'd be looking at those reports in the customer uh, center or in the reports area. You can find those kind of reports and the payments. You can add a credit card processing back to the main page. Let's go ahead and uh, close this out and analyze them then from the end result, the financial statements, and then drill back down to see what's going on with the sales receipts. So if I go here, I'm gonna to go to the, the balance sheet. So if I enter a sales receipt, notice that they had all theirs going to the checking account, but it could also be going into the undeposited funds. So in other words, the sales receipt is gonna increase some kind of payment amount. Either it's gonna be increased in the checking account if we put it directly into the checking account, which we would only want to do if we, we think that we're gonna have each individual sale hitting our bank statement with that dollar amount. If we think that we're gonna to have to group sales together as we make deposits, as might happen, if we have credit card sales, for example, or cash sales, then we might wanna put it through undeposited funds in a similar fashion as we saw with the received payment after invoicing in prior presentations. So if I, and then if it was in undeposited funds, then we would deposit it into the checking account with an extra step. If I double click the check it account here and change the date 010124, we've got our our deposits and let's see if we can look for a, a receipt payment. You know, we can actually sort these. I was gonna do these before just to, just to make this a little bit easier. If I was to customize this report and try to use my filtering, let's say we filtered the report and we, we want to filter by the type so I'm going to say I'm going to filter by the type of transaction type. And then I want to say this is going to be a sales receipt. So we'll talk more about these reports later and kind of filtering, the, filtering them later. But notice it's useful to, to note what these forms are because then you can use some of these filtering options and then you've got your sales receipt. Also just realize that when you look at the checking account, there's going to be a lot more kind of different types of forms in it because the checking account cash is like the lifeblood of the company. Most other accounts don't have as many kind of different transaction or forms that will be used within them. So if I double click on a sales receipt, so there we go, it drills us back down to the sales receipt. Closing this back out and then closing this back out, the other side would be going to revenue of some kind. So if I go to the profit and loss and we go into our revenue account, double clicking the revenue, and again, most of these, these are all invoices. I'm not sure where they put the sales receipt. If I go into the, these are all, here's a sales receipt. So there's a sales receipt that we have here, double clicking on that. Note that when I go into the sales receipt, if there was any sales tax applied, then it wouldn't include the sales tax, right? It would only charge what we charged for it. So let's see if this one had any sales tax. No, the, the sales tax will be, let's go back. Let's find one with sales tax. If I go into the materials, materials has sales tax and I go into a sales receipt. There's a sales receipt, double clicking that one. You can see there's the, there's the, the sales tax 
that is charged with sales tax, it's $1,067.88. But the amount we have here is only the $650, and that represents this number right here. So it doesn't include the sales tax is what I'm trying to point out here. Because the sales tax is going to go to the balance sheet account of the payable account. And it's going to be down here in the sales tax payable right there sales tax double clicking it changing the date 010124 and so there we have the sales tax from a sales receipt there's one oh, hold in hold on there's one right there that's a sales tax payment where's the sales receipt sales receipt here's the sales receipt doesn't have anything in it anyway sales receipt here's this here's the sales that's the sales tax payment Let's see, here's a sales receipt. Doesn't have anything in it. Sales receipt. Sales receipt. There's there's one. Double clicking on it. So there we have the tax there. So I'm going to close that back out and scroll back up and let's close this one out. And then if there's inventory involved, typically, and again, it's a little bit different with a job cost system, but usually if you're just buying inventory, marking it up and then selling it, like you'd see in like a grocery store, for example, you would double click on the inventory 010124, and you would have a decrease on the inventory from, again, a sales receipt. I could, I was going to sort it by, but there's a sales receipt, item receipt, that's an item receipt. Let's see if I can sort this one again. Let's go to customize filters. I'm going to go transaction and let's see if we can find a sales receipt and okay. Note that it's not really uncommon if you have a company that mainly bills the customers with an invoice to not have many sales receipt transactions because typically you're going to be setting up a system appropriate to your particular company. So if I, if I close this out, for example, and go to the home page, notice that this company as a construction company typically bills its customers with an invoice, meaning they do the work and then invoice the customer typically. If you have a different type of company, then most of your sales might be in a sales receipt. For example, a situation where you got like a cash register situation. In that case, the sales receipt would be recording the inventory transaction as in a similar way that we saw with the invoices. So if I go back on over to the balance sheet, let's say I go into the inventory and change the date from 010124. And let's just choose an invoice just to give an example of the same kind of idea. Note that up here we've got like a cabinet. Let's say this was just a normal inventory kind of system where you buy the inventory, mark it up and then sell it. Then for example, these line items would be showing the sales price and not the cost but the system knows what the cost is just like when you scan something at the grocery store because of the items the items are going to tell it what the cost is we'll talk about how to set up the items in future presentations but if you're using a perpetual inventory system then the system will be able to record a decrease to the quantity of units of inventory as well as the cost not the sales price of them uh, in inventory closing this back out closing this back out then the inventory will tie out to the inventory reports. If you go to the drop down up top, inventory, the inventory valuation summary here uh, should, should basically tie out if this was at 123124, 30,624, so 30,624. And then the other side would go to the profit and loss in the cost of goods sold. And once again, it would generally record if you had just like a normal marking up of the inventory and selling it type of system the cost of goods sold the expense of us selling the inventory at the cost not the sales price if dealing with inventory in that way then the net effect on net income on the profit and loss or income statement would be an increase to the income the sales price minus the expense the cost of goods sold of the of the inventory